and good morning. And I too am very pleased to be here. But I, I'm also just more excited about being in uh, this group. I mean, this group was brought together because one of your passion and your commitment to diversifying STEM. And I look forward to working with you over the next couple of days to sort of come be part of this first ever workshop here in terms of perhaps leaving with a roadmap and a framework for some of the things we could do differently to address this very critical issue of getting the STEM workforce, I'll speak more generally, not just the geosciences, much more inclusive in terms of who's participating. What I, um, sort of when I was looking at the theme, uh, I kind of like, say it really encapsulates, encapsulate quite a bit about what NSF wants to do or tries to do in terms of providing resources to you, the leaders in this field, to help really transform and advance the STEM enterprise by creating a more diverse higher education arena, but also some of the efforts we do with respect to just creating a more diverse continuum of folks so that at the higher levels they can continue to stay, participate, and be engaged. And my talk is going to be a little bit different than what we heard with the keynote speaker, because what I'm going to do is, is really talk to the resources that NSF can make available to you as you try to advance the theme of the workshop. There are tons of programs here, and I can't touch upon all of them. So what I chose to do was say first a little bit about NSF, but second, I picked some examples of the types of programs that as we're uh, developing our framework and roadmap, maybe some of these things might be useful. As we say, this is what we want to do. Perhaps in our roadmap we will say, can we go after this type of funding to affect the change we're trying to drive? So the NSF, I'll be quick here, is a very small federal agency. And it's an independent agency, and it's really supporting fundamental research and education across all the, the fields of science and engineering. So our funds reach all 50 states, and it's primarily through grants to you at academic institutions, and there's some 2,000 plus academic institutions across the nation that we support. Founded back in the 50s by President Truman, what we're about is really strengthening the research and, and um, education enterprise in science and engineering, and trying to figure out ways to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to participate and be involved. So to minimize the concentration of the funding from our agency. Um, embedded in our vision, our mission, our goals and objectives is staunch support of inclusiveness and adversity. And really, as we try to, we're very much aware of the fact to have a nation that really capitalizes on these advances and stay advanced in the field, you need everybody. And that's one of the reasons that we work so hard at creating funding opportunities to create pathways for all to be engaged. We fulfill our mission primarily through limited term grants to you. Many of the grants are, are three years in duration. And these grants are primarily identified through our merit review process. So you propose the ideas, we, we capitalize on your ideas by putting the proposals through rigorous merit review and then funding those opportunities that we think uh, has the most likelihood of succeeding in advancing our mission and goals. Um, our goals are also uh, seek to advance the frontiers of knowledge, cultivate a world-class STEM inclusive environment, and that's what I'm going to talk about here, most of my opportunities in terms of what we do there. And then really um, with respect to the workforce, part of what we try to do when we're talking about national health and prosperity, part of that is economic health and prosperity. And so some of the things that we do with ensuring that the workforce is capable and able to fully participate. Another thing that's kind of key, the element to our mission is the um, the science and engineering education. So we have a big focus on education from pre-K to grad and beyond. And so you'll see that some of the programs I'll talk about really work to, to the aspect of fully integration of research and education to achieve your mission. 
and then training the next generation of STEM leaders. Whereas by small, we have built up the $7 billion. This represents FY13 numbers. One of the key things is the whole, almost all of that money goes back out to you uh, in the form of grants to support your agenda. Um, we, we have very little overhead at the foundation. Uh, as we said, we do this for funding your proposals. Our success rate is a little bit over 20%. And um, so one of the things we always say to folks as they're seeking the funding that is very seldom that one gets uh, uh, funded the first time through. So, um, you know, when that happens, always just listen to the, the feedback, revise and resubmit. Uh, don't let that be the, the last time that you um, submit a proposal. We're small, and one of the also things we do, we rely on you quite a bit to help inform the programs that we seek to do. And one way that one can get involved in that is coming to the foundation as a rotator. We encourage folks to come and spend a couple of years at the foundation. It, it sort of helps us two ways. It helps you in terms of getting a good insight for how the agency works, and that can help you when you go back to your home institutions when you're submitting your proposals and grants. But it also helps us because it keeps us fresh with, with some of the ideas from the community to inform any of the initiatives that we might have. So getting to the, the crux of the matter here with respect to, well, what can we do and how do we do the aspect of, of broadening participation and, and advancing diversity in STEM? So, you know, our mission really um, calls for us to provide opportunities to expand the participation of, of institutions, individuals, and geographic groups in STEM disciplines. And we believe that this is really uh, vital to, to the health of the STEM enterprise. And so what we tend to do when you're looking for some of the opportunities that may be of use to you in fulfilling your goals and objectives, I decided to show just briefly the website. I'm not going to go through all of this. But what's important is to recognize that there are a slew of opportunities. And then you will get copies of these. And if you go to those websites there, you can look and see to find some of the things that might be of benefit for you. So as I stated, we're committed to broadening participation. And we're also committed to improving um, STEM education to, a, to really make sure that we have an enabled STEM workforce to, to sort of um, bring the, the economy forward. And, and um, so what I decided to do was choose a couple examples, not to speak to all. So I'm going to choose some examples that focus on what we do with respect to institutions, minority serving institutions what we do with respect to uh, primarily undergraduate institutions, some of the things we do at the two-year college level to support workforce development, but also to speak to help uh, expand and prepare that group of people that may transition to the four-year institutions to, to continue their STEM, and then talk a little bit to one program, the EPSCOR program, which is the experimental program to stimulate competitive research. That has a, a, a part of its role with respect to addressing the NSF mission at um, not having to minimize the undue concentration of the research across the country. We also have opportunities that focus on people. And so I, I have a couple here where we have bridge uh, type program which focuses on early career faculty. We have the LSAMP, Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation, which really focuses on undergraduates, uh, minority undergraduates, and, and increasing their participation. Advanced focused on women. And, and you, know, you know, we say that even though the advanced is focused on trying to ensure and keep women in academic leadership roles, it's not, awards are not just to women. And we'll say that there. Anyone who, who holds that as a key tenant of what they'd like to do is eligible to, to participate in those. And then some of the things we do at the graduate level as well as the undergraduate level. So when we talk about institutions, um, one of the objectives really is fostering the integration of research and education at academic institutions. And so we really rely on 
that the people at those institutions are the ones who are going to be recruiting, retrain, uh, retaining, and training the workforce and, and working with us to really um, develop the diverse workforce we're seeking to, to find and the diverse leaders of the staff. And so a couple of the, one of the programs here is referred to as the Historically Black Colleges and Universities Undergraduate Program, or HBCU UP. And the reason I highlighted this one is because it really goes from the whole breadth. There are opportunities here that are focused on the students. There are opportunities and tracks here that are focused on the faculty at those institutions. So it's, it's work with it's respect to trying to give the faculty opportunities to have research experiences at other institutions and at major labs. And then there are pieces that are really focused on how do you take the various learnings from their programs and institutionalize it so that it can continue to have the, a more, a larger benefit than just those students that had just participated in it. And so there are a couple of things here that um, I just wanted to talk to very quickly um, with respect to this program. So the the, the target of, I can look here. The targeted infusion projects. These are the projects that are really looking at um, trying to improve the education, STEM education at the undergraduate level. Um, and it really tries to look for ways that you can really, once you do it, you start measuring ways of, of monitoring the success so that that can inform some of the other things that one might be able to do to institutionalize it. Um, there's the, the TIPS, pro, uh, the broader broadening participation research projects, and this is the one that really seeks to create the new knowledge. So it's theory driven, and so it's a lot of work where you're funded to work at these institutions to create new knowledge and then use that to um, drive some of the um, technology transfer or innovations that are needed. The RIA is that aspect of the things that deals with the research for, for faculty. And so what it really looks for is try to give the faculty at undergraduate, at the HBCUs, more advanced or extended research opportunities. And so it looks for them to take some time off to either do that research at another institution or at a major lab and then they bring that back into the institutions and then find um, one of the other ones is the ACE and I like to talk to that because that's really really important that we we use the funds and we figure out how to standardize uh, the things that work well and institutionalize so that we don't have to learn keep repeating the same thing and, and reinventing the wheel so that's one aspect and so really the whole program can be summed up in terms of trying to develop implement and um, use evidence-based models and approaches to really advance the STEM field to uh, include, to be more inclusive and, and um, engage for the people of color uh, at these institutions. Just some examples of some of the outcomes there, just to have a flavor there too here, and not to speak to it, the one at Howard um, really, I think, not only did they get the experience in terms of doing research, but it helped some of the topics in terms of building their confidence, getting them out into competitions quite uh, more, and, and letting them see what others are doing and bringing that back to inform. Um, the one over here at all the way at the end from um, Jackson State, sorry, thank you, Jackson. One of the reasons I put that, not only did the individual, did they get the mentorship that was needed, but they had a great opportunity to sort of leverage they started figuring out how this can help and understand and fit into other other agencies' programs, and it expanded their awareness and got them more excited about being in STEM. And so they, they went and they got some additional funding to carry on after NSF seeded this from the Department of Energy as well as the National Institute of Health. Uh, the other one, I, I'll be quick on this one, um, this is again focused on two aspects of dealing with um, students at undergraduate university, uh, historically black colleges and universities. And this is primarily with an emphasis on centers, the CREST, emphasis on centers, the creation of new knowledge, so that people are getting experience not only on the knowledge that they're doing and creating, but then how they can 
use it to solve societal problems and build upon that by getting some entrepreneurial experience. And then the HBCU research infrastructure um, uh, for science and, and engineering, the RISE, and that's one that really focuses on building the infrastructure at the institutions. And so these, again, are two opportunities that we have seen a lot of success on with respect to building capacity that may be useful as we outline our plans here as an option for some of the things that might be able to fit into the roadmap. One of the other things, another program when we start talking about uh, building diversity in STEM is the tribal colleges and university programs, sometimes referred to as TCUP. And again, this is one of the programs that has very a lot of different elements. So you can pick and choose that element that might make work best for you. And so there, there are pieces there, not only in terms of just the things that might be done at the institution with the education curriculum, but those that are providing opportunities for the individuals to have research experiences. And so the goals of TCUP is primarily around promoting the high quality science, technology, engineering, and math education. It's focused primarily on um, Native Americans, Native Alaskan American um, students at those uh, institutions. And it really, one of the things I like about this, is in addition to that, this is a program that has embedded in it uh, encouragement of things to include veterans into the STEM pipeline. A couple of uh, things here in terms of some of the outcomes of the, the TCUP program. One in Hawaii, and um, there's a, a number of other things behind this with respect to this being like the first seed and then um, the continuing the building. There's a lot that's going on at Kapiolani with respect to the near peer mentoring where the students really do stay engaged and so those that go through the program continue to come back so they can be there to support and help the, uh, other in, the newer students at the institutions. And then um, a program from Dende College that really works at trying to make sure people understand the, the issues and the pathways and providing the mentorship and the support along the way. I am just not going to speak to these, but I'm going to just make bring to your attention that what the slides have is not only a little bit about the opportunity that you may want to use, but it gives you the most recent solicitation. So if you, you go to the NSF website, if this is something that's of interest to you, you can go back and get a little bit more information. It usually gives you the name of the program officer, and please, we encourage you always to call them. Don't hesitate for calling them and asking questions, and um, because that's what we're there to do. Again, this one is designed for um, supporting undergraduates at various institutions, but I want to just um, get to to this one here with respect to, because I think sometimes we, we, we um, tend to overlook the value of some of the two-year colleges in terms of how they can help and what they are adding to the diversity in the STEM pipeline here. And so there are quite a few opportunities with, uh, within NSF that kind of helps you um, work with that way at those two-year colleges. And I'll tell you there are two tracks. There's, so there's the track there with respect to just vocational type things, which is very needed. And in that case, there are a lot of times where the college and industries are working very closely together to ensure that the curriculum is meeting the needs so that when you leave out from there, you have the skills to work in that area. And so the ATE has a lot of great examples of things that have done in the fiber optics, fiber optics industry as well as in the renewable energy industry in terms of preparing people that can go out there and build those big turbines and, and some of the real-time data. But there's another key part to here, too, in terms of the curriculum and all of the things that are done with respect to working with the two-year two colleges to make sure that the curricular um, or maybe similar to what's at the four-year institution, so help that with that transition. So that when they do move from a two-year college to the four-year college, they've already had a lot of the, the courses, the type of courses at the same level and caliber, and are more likely to stay and um, continue. And then one of the others, which, which touches upon a, a number of different areas here, is the EPSCOR program. And um, the EPSCOR program is somewhat unique in that it is the foundation's only state-based program. 
And so um, to, be, to participate, you, you're a jurisdiction or a state that receives uh, three quarters of a percent or less of the research funds. But some of the things that are really creative and innovative in this program is that it really uses, it really uses a governing committee to sort of try to include the whole state in the STEM process. So it's not just the larger research institutions, but it's really inclusive in terms of bringing the two-year colleges, the, the, the post-secondary and secondary um, institutions, um, private sector, uh, and um, the governor's office, some local government. All are involved in this partnership to, to affect the change that's needed. And uh, it really is a close partnership between the NSF and those participating in the program. There are about 28 states that are eligible to participate, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and Guam. And uh, the program started back in the 80s, and we had our most recent entrance in 2012 for Guam and Missouri. And how we sort of affect the change here is by funding folks to build the research infrastructure that's used to advance your academic research competitiveness. And embedded in here is the fact that you can't just do it with just equipment, that you really have to figure out ways to get the people involved, um, ways to um, ensure that it, you're developing the resources all the way throughout. And so here's just some of the results um, from one program, our largest statewide program just for FY13, in terms of having funded about 19 undergraduate research postdoctoral fellows that are underrepresented, uh, over 200 underrepresented graduate students, and about 600 or 700 underrepresented minority undergraduate students were funded in our program. Some inf information in terms of those involved at the various uh, institutions. So in terms of faculty that we've supported and worked with at minority serving institutions, all the way to the number of people, students we directly touched in the K-12 arena in FY13 alone. And then looking at some of the successes, Alabama is in our program, one of the jurisdictions in our program, and they have really been very successful in developing, creating, following, and mentoring African-American PhDs in STEM. And so, you know, since 20, 2003, they've been 28, supported by our program. This is just some of the examples of them in the years that they've come. And what Tuskegee has been able to do very well, and many other institutions I think are doing this too, is in terms of following them and supporting them even after they graduate. Uh, through the alumni reach, say they come back, they give to the students. But they also um, um, is good because it, it helps keep the program kind of fresh, again, as they bring back. So some of these have gone to postdocs uh, at Cornell. Others have been into industry, and some are faculty members at various institutions across the state. One of the things that's really been good in Kansas EBSCO was with respect to developing and engaging Native Americans in STEM. And this is just some of the uh, folks that have uh, been benefited and tracked through our program just in Kansas and where they are. And a lot of the way they've done it in Kansas is relying on a cohort mechanism. And it was really one of the things that really touched me at one point was one of the last classes, there was even a grandmother in the classroom in terms of, and he said, she said, can I come? And then, yeah. And so even having her in the room helped and encouraged some of the students. But they get them, the students get their experiences, but then they work with them to say, Let's see what else we could do to help you to maintain and stay in this enterprise. And so we pick some of the ones in terms of where they've gone, the types of fellowship supports that they've been um, supported to get, whether they're furthering things from NSF or whether they are other types of fellowships. And again, this is just the, the cohort for the last couple of years from our Kansas EPSCOR program. And I'm going to end now, but something we're doing is experiment. And we refer to it as our RI Track 3. And um, it's really what we wanted to do here well, was trying to find or see perhaps some transformative approaches that might, with the results come up, we could then scale up nationally. And so the whole idea was you're making a proposal here with respect to an idea or a thought, and you have to be able to, to sort of you know, think about and be able to be able to talk to your successes 
your perceived successes and how you want to scale that up. So we did about 10 projects in here, and this is just a sample of them to sort of say, um, we went from high, uh, K to middle school all the way up to the graduate level, okay, in terms of the people there, the targeted groups, whether they are um, African American, and one of the key things here, a lot of F score is rural. So aspect of our diversity is how you're making sure underserved rural communities have an opportunity to get engaged in the STEM pipeline. So there were some issues there with, with Hispanic and rural, native Alaskans, et cetera. And then some of the things that were used. They were allowed to sort of build upon existing models. So you upward bound with some of it, but you had to so what you're gonna do different and build on it. So some used an existing model. Some talked about using informal learning and education. Some have an idea of cyber, cyber learning to sort of advance this. And so we just started this. We don't have any results yet. And the whole idea is that when we start getting the results, we're gonna pick a couple of these and fund them at a, a higher level to sort of help with the development of standardizing and uh, adapting and adopting for national uh, use. Um, in, this, in the presentation, we'll be have more information about uh, opportunities targeted to individuals that I don't have the time to speak to here, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention. And with that, I think I right, I stop and take any questions. So thank you. So we're going to use the mics this time and pass them around. So the scale up effort that you're showing now um, is primarily related to the F school states? No. Okay. It's not? No, though, here, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, and this thing fell, so I don't know how it, but, so we're using it as a pilot within the F score jurisdictions. So we seeded these things as a pilot. We just started this in FY13, so we do not have the results. But when it's time to sort of say, here are some things that we think can be scaled up, the whole intent is that is something that you can scale up nationally. Mm -hmm. And so we will be partnering with other parts of the NSF to get that access and that reach. Mm -hmm. And I just also want to say, and I forgot to, that I have also my NSF colleague here, Dr. Marilyn Souter, who could also probably answer some questions with respect to some of these programs. Is so. there, and is there, do you know if there's any effort in other parts of NSF to identify these um, exemplary programs? Or I think other programs do have um, tracks with respect to that goal, okay? I can't speak to all of them, but they do have tracks. But I will say the reason that we did this in EPSCOR is because we, um, because we are a group of, of jurisdictions that represent half the nation. And so we really do present a good test bed community and we have the connections that we can get out broader to sort of, sort of pilot some of these things that then as we bring the rest of the foundation with us that may reach those pieces that we don't have those connections with. And so that was the intent. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have a question about the definition of diversity. I've heard you um, talk about different audiences and so I'm curious sure. what, how the NSF defines diversity and then I guess uh, one of the reasons I'm asking this is I'm here at the University of Colorado in Boulder and we target a lot of um, first generation college and low income right. which seems like and rural which all go together Correct. and that seems like it's not well represented in um, solicitations. Okay. Um, the, the, the use of diversity is very broad. So we speak to diversity with respect to people, institutions, and disciplines. And even within EPSCOR, we, um, we embrace that full diversity of definitions. Because we have rural, we track rural engagement because we have low income. But I will say for NSF, with respect to the definition of underrepresented minorities in STEM. That's a much more narrow definition. And that definition refers to women, people of color, peoples with disabilities. Women, people of color, and peoples with disabilities. So Native Americans, uh, Native Alaskans, underrepresented minorities in STEM. 
but the whole NSF embraces diversity much broader. That encapsulates all of that, and then different programs have different levels of strength on one part of that versus the other. Our program has much more emphasis on rural, first generation type thing, low income, where other parts of the foundation have more emphasis in their programs on women or persons with disabilities, et cetera. Um, quick question about um, evaluation of programs. Yes. Do you have a central evaluation of programs so that everybody's been evaluated on the same things, or do you leave it to the individual programs to evaluate themselves? We have <laughs> evaluation at number parts. So we, we one of our, we, we get evaluated. We have lots of eyes on our programs, okay? And we have two, two prongs to the evaluation. We have the project level evaluation. So we make funds to a jurisdiction for a project. And it's required that they have an external, independent, third-party evaluator. And that evaluation is intended to say, are we making the progress on our project as we proposed? So and it helps them sort of get back on track to what they propose to do for their project. We then have program-level evaluation at NSF EPSCoR as a program that rolled all up. Are you achieving your goals and your missions? Okay, and we are undergoing one such evaluation right now by the Science Technology Policy Institute. In addition to that, all parts of NSF go through what we call Committee of Visitors assessment of their programs and evaluation every three years. That also looks at your mechanism, your funding mechanism, but two, are you achieving your goals? Are you uh, uh, getting to your mission? So yes, we do them. That's a quick follow-up as well. Once you've identified best practices, how do you disseminate them? For in EPSCoR, it's somewhat easy because we, we know each other, okay? The other thing, though, is we all have websites. We get out, one of the big things that we have done in terms of trying to collaborate, the collaboration between EPSCoR and non-EPSCoR. Non and one of the things we also did was funded a communication workshops uh, that went to all of our jurisdictions where we brought external um, contractors in that went to the jurisdictions and worked with folks in terms of how do you communicate, effectively communicate, disseminate your information to a variety of, of different audience segments, and how do you do it well. And so to help us, we're trying to brand everything around three things, talking to what our program does in advancing science, talking to what our program does in STEM, education, and then because our program requires cost share from the jurisdictions, that's a, a 20% match to the funds. They have to also advance economic development in those jurisdictions. It's one of the key things why we have workforce development. And so we speak to how have you impacted society by uh, driving economic development in your jurisdictions. And so we assess and evaluate ourselves around those three key elements. The um, National Exceed Program has a lot of opportunities for students. One of them is the Exceed Scholars. And um, I was wondering about the recruitment mechanisms. When, uh, when I get the announcement that they're recruiting scholars, I send it to AHEC. I send it to, um, um, uh, let's see, Haku. Mm -hmm. And I send it to um, NAFIO. Mm -hmm. But what I see here is an incredible network for recruiting students, and I don't think we use it. And I wonder whether there's a mechanism for getting the word out to all of your participants about some of these other opportunities, because we could really complement each other's activities and our efforts very well. Sure. Um, there is a, a network of, of our leaders for the various projects, and so that's 31 folks there who have a responsibility for disseminating across the state. But you did say exceed, right? Right. And so we have a, per, a person in our office. We've been having conversations with members of the Exceed team, particularly the outreach group, um, trying to strengthen our linkages in, in terms of uh, how can we do things together. So you know, it, it shares with things like how much access are they getting at some of the resources and tools? What do we have to do to get opportunities out? And so they tend to send us stuff that we disseminate through our communities. And then when we meet, we try to, yeah, so we, we bring that to their attention as well as a number of other things. But the, the thing is following up and making sure they're fully taking advantage of these opportunities. I think are we out of time? Yeah, we'll okay. thank our speaker again. Thank you.